Good tidings, all you beautiful individuals. Welcome to another epi of League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you, and we we weren't around for the initial weekend recap on the Monday for all the playoff action, so we're a bit removed, so we're going into the details, the nitty-gritty, the bigger picture for some of these series, and obviously, gotta touch on another installment in the saga that is Gen G versus T1 because time and time again we hype it up to no degree and time and time again we get not only five games but multiple points in this series that are absolutely game and series altering that's just what happens when these two match up oh man it's a guarantee gen g versus t1 you're finding at least a couple of clips that you're sending to your friends going i can't believe these guys pulled this off or look at this play incredible stuff and you know what no shortage of that this time around. Certainly a series that delivered all the way through and on both sides, delivering that excitement for Gen G, for T1. And it ultimately leads to that climax in game five where Gen G and Pays lay down the hammer and claim the series for themselves. And obviously, one of the guys we talk about the least on this Gen G squad is Mr. Delight, but he got his full due and attention after this series. Some of the best Alistair engages and performance across the board that we've seen in the history of the LCK in this series. And by the way, there's been some pretty damn good Alistairs over the years. Yeah, really good competition for that type of title over in the LCK. And make no mistake, Delight is very much deserving to be put into that conversation, especially with these performances in this series against T1, but certainly something we have seen over the course of this split and this year, the way that he has really, I think, found his form, found his mojo with the rest of this Gen G roster on how they want to best utilize him, how he wants to communicate with his teammates to get these plays in motion. I think that's a big part of the positivity that you see around Gen G and where you see them looking so much more complete and able to withstand these type of blows, these type of punch backs from a team like T1 and still come out on top at the end of the day in the series. So now you look at this matchup. Obviously, Gen G goes to the finals, T1 goes to losers. But you look at this matchup now, going back to 2022, because, okay, Ruler left, but fundamentally, these have been basically nine of the same players for almost two years now going head to head. And I'm calling this the best rivalry that we have in the scene right now. Not going historically, you know, G2 Fnatic was obviously fantastic. But right now, this current era, this has got to be the best rivalry in any region because you've actually had back and forth. T1 gets a win at MSI. Gen g has been racking up the LCK lately. They're always competitive and going back and forth. You get those punches going back both ways. That's where you see that fight. That's where it builds that type of tension for whenever they're going to meet up these type of events. Gen G versus T1. One of the things I love about this series, of course, is Faker versus Chovy. Chovy has been that young player that has developed up and is at that point now where you're saying, okay, start to deliver, start to take these strides that we know you're capable of against some of the very best of the best, against the guy that is the typical, the picture of what it is to be a mid laner in the LCK. Chovy has risen up to that challenge with Genji, rising up with as that leader of that team. You look at the other members of what is going on. Talk about Peanut. My man was a T1 member at some point. Now he's on the other side of this rivalry. And of course, leading it all for uh, Gen G. Score, Coach Score. You think he's not got to settle? They got to score to settle himself against T1. He's making sure he's knocking it down in the coaching role this time. Yeah, I mean, the storylines of rivalry goes even deeper than, yeah, just the five players that are on this rift. And I mean, now Gen G, potential for a three-peat. It's been years since we're talking about anyone doing a three-peat in the LCK peak. Dom1 wasn't even doing that when they were dominating the league. And, I mean, God bless Faker and T1 because, again, a month ago we were saying this team has no chance making Worlds. Playoffs turn around and boom, they're playing five games. It's it's one chem take uh, team fight away from potentially winning the series and going to finals. Which, I mean, we're a couple days removed, but I'm still pretty hot about that type of decision to go for it in game five full credit for what gen g does in their execution in that point when t1 chooses to make that engage to make that play for the dragon it's not meant to be it was not meant to be red and white on a please do not fight 
The other, only other rivalries maybe you can talk about in this conversation are, okay, KT and T1, the Telecom War, it's building up. We're going to get another match in the loser's bracket, but T1's mostly still had KT's number in that head-to-head. -head. Again, that can change in losers. And then if BLG just won a single series against JDG, of course, these teams have played so many times this year, you could be talking about them in that conversation, but that's not a rivalry. It's just JDG beating up on their little brother. You got to go back to, you know, a smed death score that era of kt to find where the telecom war was at operating at that type of level yes we want to see and i think we might have an opportunity for it in this lower bracket matchup that we are going to get between t1 and kt for kt to make that attack make that push and get that punch in on t1 to spice up that rivalry but as you said blg jdg if we just could have got a little bit more pushback a little bit more sweetness for the BLG side to taste against JDG. Yes, I would put it into that conversation. We're not quite there yet. Another one from the past that I think a lot of people are kind of forgetting about how good, how heated it was at the time. Go look at G2 and Fnatic over in the LEC. That was a really great rivalry that had it going on all sorts of ways. Yeah, as good as T1 Gen G is, I don't know if it'll ever. I don't know if any rivalry will ever, ever reach that level that we had between G2 and Fnatic. LCS over the weekend, the headlines for me, stolen by a couple of LCK imports who absolutely have been worth the money. We got all these shattered fragments of the defending champion DRX, and you got Piosic leading the charge, bringing his team to a world championship. First jungler in the history of the LCS to pick up a pentakill. This guy was absolutely lethal across Viego in this series, and I'm Kind of gobsmacked he got to play it so many times. I don't think anybody, even if you were a supporter like myself of Piosic back when they does capture the world championship with DRX, I don't think anybody saw the DRX implosion and saw where Piosic settled in and said, he's the one. He's going to lock in that world spot before the rest of his teammates and make sure he's there to defend the title. He's bringing Core JJ with him with Team Liquid for this trip over two worlds. This is extremely exciting, I think, for North American fans to see this Team Liquid roster and have some of the names and, and, and players that it has delivered with. And especially now with APA in that mid lane, you are really excited about it as an NA fan. And obviously survived the reverse sweep. Does Team Liquid to bounce back in game five? And truthfully, as odd as it is, because they just won the head-to-head -head against Golden Guardians, I feel better about GG in a best of five against the fourth seed from the LEC to clinch a final world spot than I do for Team Liquid just because of the history of this organization. I could easily see them, the pressure maybe getting to them a little bit in that do or die best of five, whereas the Guardians, they already been to MSI. They're already experienced at that. I might be excited about Team Liquid going through. I still have those doubts and those concerns, which is leading to, as you said, I will take that guarantee for a team like Team Liquid to get on through and have a, a better path. Whereas I think that a Golden Guardians, you know what? I've got that confidence that you got that dog in you and you can fight your way through and we'll clutch it out because what we have seen from you either through the course of the LCS and we've seen when you had to dig deep. And then of course, even that experience, you're looking at MSI, uh, finding a way to challenge and rise up and beat the expectations a lot of people had for you in that situation, even if they were about LCS rock bottom low. That's that's a separate discussion. But we do feel good about looking at these two. And, and yes, uh, pretty happy if the situation plays itself out the way that Team Liquid could be moving in as that third seed. And then we go with GG as the fourth. The other LCK import who stole the weekend headlines and has stole headlines ever since he came over. So much so that we got to start putting this guy in the conversation of maybe one of the best imports ever in the LCS. And we are talking about C9 Berserker because that was about as big an ADC gap, no offense to FBI, as you can see in a series. And as, as soon as this guy joined Cloud9, he's picking up MVPs and he's only accelerated from his debut with this squad. He has clearly been the best AD carry ever since he came across the pond. And one of the biggest things that I think isn't quite talked about enough with Berserker, and especially looking at this past split where his numbers aren't necessarily the numbers that are eye-popping and you're going, yes, this is very clearly that Berserker difference type of thing going on. 
He's been so incredibly clutch for this C9 team. Anytime they need to dial up a little bit of extra damage, they need that ADC to be that type of threat in a game. Berserker is there for them and delivering upon that for Cloud9. I think he is a major, major piece of that engine that keeps things rolling, keeps that speed going for a team like Cloud9, top of the LCS. And I, I want to draw a comparison that's a big compliment to Berserker, to Viper on Hanwha Life, because he's a guy who, when team fights roll around, it doesn't even matter if he's fed. He draws so much pressure from the opposing squads, A, because he's playing so aggressively and far forward that he forces that pressure, but B, they know, the opposing team knows that Viper or Berserker are the guys to kill. They blow so many cooldowns, but on the other side, Berserker and Viper always seem to have summoners and ultis up, and it's so impossible to kill them that even when they get all this attention, it seems more often than not, they're still finding a way to survive. Of all the LCS ADCs, I think one of the things that, again, Berserker has over everybody else is when I'm thinking about, okay, when the support decides to roam and now it's 1v1, or maybe it's gonna be 1v2, maybe 1v3 if the jungler is coming on down to that lane. Berserker is the guy I got the most faith in, in getting out of that type of situation, still living, finding a way to keep it going, get back to base, grab your items, get back down into that lane and handle business. That is what Berserker has done in the LCS. Been extremely dependable for a team like Cloud9, whether it is depending on that damage coming through in those team fights or not falling down, not getting beat up by the targeted attention of the enemy team. Because yes, past couple of years have gone by. It's not just us that have noticed that Berserker is a major problem to deal with for an enemy team. And even though that seems to be what everyone realizes, doesn't matter. They can't stop it. He's inevitable. His domination in that bottom lane. And now somehow we've actually synced up the LCK and LCS bracket in playoffs that we have the top three going into that finals weekend in Korea and North America. We'll obviously do a full preview of all three of those teams remaining. We finally get LEC back on the rift later this week. And Matt, there's still a tournament going on there, guys. Did you know that? It's pretty crazy to think that this is the type of time, and this is absolutely, make no mistake, going to be something that we're going to be talking about when we're reviewing the LEC's scheduling changes and the effects that it has had, some the foreseen and the unforeseen. This is definitely one of them that we are seeing ahead of time and we are dealing with currently. Full preview, full steam ahead later this week. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark with you beautiful people. As always, thank you so much for watching, and we will catch you on that flippity flip.